morning we're going to talk about a great cabinet to talk. So I'm really excited. We have um, two amazing panelists. And to start, my name is Lindsay Dahl. I'm the Chief Impact Officer here at Ritual. And I'm super excited to do this in our, our store, which is just less than a month old. Um, and so not only is the entire brand Ritual built on educating people about the importance of what we put in our bodies, we thought it'd be good to also talk about what we put on our bodies. And so we're doing an educational series um, over the spring and summer. And this is kind of a continuation of that. The theme and focus is around motherhood, so regardless of where you are in your life's journey, we're talking about important topics that are related to your health and ultimately um, which impacts the health of your baby down the line. So um, without further ado, I'm going to have you all introduce yourself because there's nothing worse than watching someone read off of a piece of paper. Um, so maybe can both of you just quickly introduce yourselves and then we can dive into some questions. Sure. Um, so I'm Emily Haslett, I'm the Senior Director of Brand Marketing at Genexa. Genexa is the first clean medicine company, so um, based in Atlanta, but I still live here, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about how we bring clean to over-the-counter medicine. And I'm Sean King, I'm the founder of Spa Ritual, and we launched in 2005, first in the nail care category, we were the first vegan free of um, nail polish uh, brand on the market, and then a year later we came out with our body care range. And we're just all about slowing down, taking deep and meaningful care of yourselves through the practice of um, slow beauty rituals. And you're also an author, correct? And I'm also an author, yes. I wrote a book called Slow Beauty, you know, about the philosophy and just, uh, you know, how to you know, practice self care at home and, and a, you know, a, an approachable, inclusive, and reasonably priced way. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll get into that um, yeah. a little bit more. Okay, so to level set, we obviously at Ritual focus really deeply about what ingredients we use in our products, and that's really important. Um, and just to kind of talk about the state of the science for a minute, um, over the last 40 or 50 years, there's been evolving science that shows us that certain chemicals, not all chemicals, um, uh, can be toxic to human health and the environment. And so as this has kind of evolved, so has the clean category. Regardless of how you feel about the term clean, um, it's there's definitely a body of science that shows us that we need to think a little bit more deeply about what we put, what we put in and on our bodies. Um, so Emily, I want to start with you. Your business and you're part of the original startup crew basically wanted to reinvent over-the-counter medicine. Talk to us about the kind of journey and what you saw as the need in the marketplace and why your business is this today. Sure. Uh, so over-the-counter medicine, I'm sure we've all at one point taken it. Our two founders were dads and they were having young kids and went to the medicine aisle, you know, trying to live this really clean, healthy lifestyle. And then the first time the kid gets sick, they go to the aisle and they see all of these artificial and active ingredients in this fever reducer. And so they were like, we need to rethink this. This is not what we want putting in our kids' bodies, but we need this product. And so that's really how we came up with the idea. And, you know, we make medicine with the same effective active ingredient, like acetaminophen or diphenhydramine, but instead of artificial fillers, we use only organic non-GMO fillers like citrus extract, uh, rice bran extract, you know, things that you can actually need and print out. So, it's kind of revolutionary because never before, you know, you can see dye-free medicines or they will say no parabens, but nobody's ever really cleaned up the entire filler system. Yeah, I like that. Um, and it's amazing that no one had done it before you all in 2016 when you launched. Yeah. yeah, and you're ingesting it, so yep. it's kind of important to think about. Okay, let's talk about a little bit more about the product offering. You said you started in the male category, a yes. spot ritual, and you're expanding or you have expanded into body care. Tell us yes. about what you offer and why it's important, especially for people in the kind of pre-pregnancy or pregnancy phase. Yeah, I mean, I actually, um, I was working on the brand when I was pregnant with my son, um, who is graduating at the end of this week, which is incredible, mm -hmm. uh, from high school. And so at the time when we were working on the, on the nail polish brand, um, you know, the hot button ingredients were dimethyltalate and tolerumine and formaldehyde, formaldehyde resin. And so I wanted to create and offer a product and a range that was healthier. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we were offering something on the market that was safe and effective. And we primarily sell to professionals. 
And so they use their products day in and day out, and I wanted to make sure that also the people that were being the most exposed to the product, um, you know, were, were using something that was safe for them, and then that they had this opportunity to educate their clients. I mean, at the time, it was, you know, it was 2004, 2005, and nobody was really talking about, um, you know, hot button ingredients and making healthier choices. It was, it was, you know, everyone thought that it wouldn't work. Uh, so it was definitely, it's amazing, you know, how far we've, we've come. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, you know, what I wanted to do for the nail care category. And then for body, you know, I thought, you know, everyone is very focused on their face, but we have, you know, all the skin from the neck down. And I wanted to offer, again, some, you know, a range of products that are safe and effective that have a high percentage of certified organic ingredients that are incredibly nourishing, that don't have the fillers, you don't need to have those um, unnecessary fillers in, in your um, you know, body care products. And so we came out with the whole body care range that has, I mean, it's like um, body oil, body salves, creams, which I've been gifting to everyone today. Um, hand serum, hand salve, so everything for that. If you want to go get a professional body care treatment, or if you want to do self care at home, like a self massage, or just you know add hydration, um, you know for everything from neck down. So I uh, you both hit on something that I want to pull the thread a little bit. So sometimes people think if you're doing things clean or well that the products don't work. Yes. Talk about from both of your company's perspective. <laughs> is that true? How do you address that and get about that when, you, when you're formulating? Sure, so that's, you know, we're innovating a category of medicine that's been around for hundreds of years, and some of the products that are on shelves today haven't really changed in the last 60 years. You know, I remember growing up as a kid, and my mom would give me an antacid or a fever reducer, and it was the same brand. It's the same brand that you see all over the shelves today. And so. One of the biggest hurdles we've had is how do we help people understand that this is the same effective active ingredient, but just without the artificial fillers. So it's been a lot of education to kind of explain that there are two different types of ingredients in medicine. And you're not just taking acetaminophen, that can be 5%. So, you know, what we're trying to educate people about is how to read the drug facts label. So active ingredients always come first. That's you know, the amount of the drug that you're taking, and then you scroll all the way to the bottom of the panel, second to last section, inactive ingredients, and that's really what we've innovated. So we're not creating new drugs, we're not going through new drug applications, we're just using the proven effective medicinal ingredient and then cleaning up what surrounds it. So I think people are, you know, they're trying it, and they're like, wow, this actually, this works. I'm like, yes, yeah. <laughs> because it's the same. I feel like sometimes, especially as a parent, kids get like fevers all the time and <clears throat> teething and whatever. I think it's totally fine just me personally. Um, I still want to give my kid <laughs> Tylenol or acetaminophen, but it feels like you have two choices. One is just don't give anything to your child or traditional brands. So I like how your business is really kind of filling that space. Okay, so let's take a little tour around the house. Um, we're talking about a lot about what we put in and on our body. But our homes are a built environment. And especially when we think about um, trying having bringing a baby home into a home environment, talk us through if you have any either tips or kind of favorite brands in the kitchen category, household cleaners, all of the kind of things that we may be exposing ourselves or our children to. Do you have any favorites? Yeah, I really love Rose. I feel like for the cleaning space, not only from sustainability, they have. Um, you know, glass bottles and reusable cleaners, but they're using, I think, almost entirely natural ingredients, um, which is, you know, you can make your own cleaners if you'd like, but, you know, it kind of compounds. So I, I love that we're having this conversation because it's not just about, you know, cleaning up your food, cleaning up your beauty, but, like, everything that you ingest and put on your skin and are exposed to compounds throughout the day. So I think in some of the areas where you can really clean up the largest quantities, like cleaning supplies, like obviously food I think is pretty easy. Um, I think it just helps reduce our exposure overall to these artificial ingredients. And you know, little babies, they're so tiny and you know, they need they need to be looked after in that same way, you know, being more cognizant about what's in their food, what's in their medicine, you know, if you give them supplements, what's in that. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think just minimizing, 
I'm definitely a minimalist when it comes to you know any you know my skincare rituals, my cleaning rituals. So I like to use I mean Grove Collective is a great brand, but I like multi-purpose products when it comes to cleaning. So you're not mixing a bunch of different products. Um, also for laundry, I'm big into fragrance free. I don't put anything in. I don't do anything in the dryer with dryer sheets, even the natural ones. But just really being minimal. I mean, especially with babies and like the clothing and the sheets and everything. Just fragrance free is is really key. Mm -hmm. in that category. Two other tips, um, especially for babies' nursery, you prioritize where your baby's going to be spending the most time. So sleeping, hopefully. <laughs> well, no, sleeping a lot right there. Yeah. Um, and so investing in a really good non-toxic mattress that doesn't have flame retardants is like one of the best things both for adults and for babies. It's definitely the biggest investment in your house, but it's worth it um, because sometimes you can't like tackle everything all at once. That feels a little intimidating. Um, and then also cookware is huge. So we've been hearing a lot about fluorinated compounds called forever chemicals, which are... Um, they're used across all sorts of applications from makeup to um, raincoats, anything that repels water, like your steam treatments in your couches. But cookware, so nonstick pots and pans, is one of the kind of big things to avoid. I use nonstick pots and pans forever until I enter this field. If you guys know, like the peeling off of the whenever you're cooking, um, they're coated. And so there's a lot of great options out there stainless steel, cast iron, even some ceramic finishes. Um, that can help kind of give you that non-stick finish without uh, exposing yourself unnecessarily to chemicals that can persist in our body and environment. Um, we'll get to questions in just a couple minutes, so make sure you follow them away. Um, okay, you mentioned a little bit in the beginning, you're an author, you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the premise of it, what's the philosophy, where can we go get your book? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's available on Amazon. Um, I wrote the book, um, it came out in 2017, but it was a philosophy called Slow Beauty that I was developing over many years. Um, and it actually, um, I mean, I really was seated in, you know, in childhood, you know, when I was growing up with my mom, and she was in everything we're talking about. This is what my mom was about, like the overexposure to um, chemicals um, in our environment. She was acutely aware of that. She was constantly educating me to look at beauty care packaging and, and you know, avoid certain ingredients, you know, advising me on which products were, were better uh, for me, um, you know, organic food. So she was just really hyper aware of health and wellness and toxic chemicals in the environment and how to minimize exposure to that. So when I went out, when I went, went to college, I just, she put me on this path where I fell in love with health and beauty and wellness and I, you know, yoga in college, and this was a long time ago. Yoga wasn't like on every street corner and available, so we used to go off campus um, to find a class. I, I um, meditation, so I just kind of added to my, I continued to add to my education along the way. And then when I moved out to California almost 30 years ago, um, I discovered Ayurveda, the practice of Ayurveda. So all of this was very seated in my life, and Slow Beauty happened, um, really this was, you know, 2000, my son was in kindergarten at the time, and we brought home, um, we were house-sitting his class pet Tori the tortoise, and I just really fell in love, you know, this, this animal, this creature was in our home, and, you know, very meditative and slow, and it was at the same time where you know, social media was starting to take off. We were, and we were checking multiple emails and voicemails and social media, and there's all this pressure to be on 24-7 all the time. And I really just had this like visceral re reaction to all that and felt like, you know what, the world is getting faster and faster. It shows no signs of slowing down, and we're going to have to set our own boundaries around that. You know, nobody's going to help us to do that. And they're, I felt like I was being pulled into this vortex and I didn't know if there was a way out. So this idea of slow beauty came to mind um, and I just started writing about it and blog posting about it and being interviewed about the concept. 
and incorporating it more and more into the spa ritual brand. It gives me a platform to talk about this. Um, how we set boundaries around our self care. You know, when I had kids, I, you know, when I had a baby, you know, it was hard to find time to take a shower, you know, to really take care of myself. And um, that is, it is the truth that, you know, we have to take care of ourselves in meaningful ways in order to best take care for others and the world around us. So we have to make sure as moms that, you know, we're, you know, questioning, you know, what are we doing for, for self care? And so, so we can be more present for our baby. Um, and not so fragmented. And so, I mean, that's where it was seated. And I just, you know, I was introduced to a book agent. I wasn't ready to write a book at the time. I thought it was just, a, you know, a blog post here and there. And I, you know, I just, something clicked. It was all of a sudden I had an outline. I got back in touch with the book agent, and it's just one of those things like, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Joseph Campbell, and I'm paraphrasing it, but it's like, when you're ready, you know, the doors just start flying open, like when you're really aligned with something, and that's what happened. You know, it just kind of really took off from there. Um, I presented to a few people, I had a few book offers, and I made a decision which um, publishing firm to go with, and, you know, wrote the book and, and put it out into the world. So, yeah, I mean, it's all about slowing down and how to take, you know, care of yourself, but, you know, doing it in a way that's reasonable, it's simple, it's, you know, you can find things in your house, you don't have to spend a ton of money. I just wanted it to be very inclusive um, and affordable. Um, I, thought, I think there's a whole aspect of wellness that is the opposite of that, you know, and it really is still about perfectionism and kind of these little beauty standards and that were... You know, the beauty industry has always been about. So this is really personal. It's about your personal um, self-care journey and just reminding you, giving you position, you're giving you permission to slow down, and that it's okay to take care of yourself. Well, I love that. I think it's a good transition for us to open up to questions. I think it also relates to a lot of the work that we do at Ritual, which takes us a long time to launch products, and it's because there's a lot of intentionality behind it and. Um, the whole core of the brand is focused on traceability, which is hard. You have to understand and know your suppliers, and um, we select and partner with people who care as much about their supply chains as we care about theirs, <laughs> which isn't always the case, as you might expect, um, but it's important. And so the, our brand really was founded on the concept and focusing on um, not only all people, but especially the prenatal audience, knowing that our founder um, really also a concept of this brand when she was pregnant. And um, so I feel like there's a lot of synergy between our three brands. And I think it's great that there's a whole kind of booming economy of companies helping to fill this need. Um, and I also just want to put a finer point on something you mentioned, which is really important, which is off, oftentimes the clean choices are not only for ourselves, but imagine all the people that are touched in your supply chain. So there's a strong, um, an important social justice component to this work as well, because if you're doing responsible sourcing as your businesses, you're thinking about how are people in the ecosystems being impacted when we're consuming all of this. So that certainly, I'm sure, is not lost on any of us. Um, questions from the audience. What questions do you have about either um, any of our brands or in general kind of cleaning up your house and tackling toxic chemicals? I was surprised to hear about the footwear. I feel like every time I hear about it, it's like, whoa. Are there any other product categories that you feel like people don't know enough about that are impacting our health and are kind of like getting, you know, washed out that they're actually not clean? Okay. I'll let you go next up. I mean, I think carpet is, is one of those categories, and there definitely are options now that are more eco friendly, but, you know, if you're that was something I learned very early on. Like, my mom had carpet laid in our house. She started having an allergic reaction, like here, and, and she knew this is how cute we were. She knew there was something in you know the glues that they were using to lay down the carpet that were toxic, and she had to pull everything up. So I think that's something we want to look at. Um, I mean, paints. There, there's so many options out there now, which is which is great. But I guess those are two households. And then you brought up mattresses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think medicine, going back to medicine, like it's still an area where people, I think, are like, oh, but it's medicine, like it's supposed to help me. And then, you know, there's studies that show that, you know, we still don't know the long term effects of artificial ingredients, but there are sub ingredients that aren't listed in medicines. Um, fragrance, I recently learned there's a great documentary on HBO Max called Not So Pretty, and they go through four episodes of the beauty industry and one of them that they doubled down on was fragrance and like all the phthalates that are in fragrances and it doesn't have to be listed because it's considered a trade secret. So I think there's, you know, as you mentioned, red dye number 40, like there's certain ingredients that you can just be on the lookout for that exist in more products and in places that you wouldn't necessarily think. And you know, it's not meant to be scary, but there is there are so many options and so many alternatives that once you know what to look out for, you can easily find something that's cleaner or healthier in that area. Yep. Uh, the final category is flame retardants, which is related to mattresses. Who's talking about flame retardants? They don't actually slow the spread of fires. Fun fact. Brilliantly branded by giving it a name, it's something it doesn't actually do. Um, but there are chemicals that are used, especially in our couches, by the pounds. And um, thankfully, again, there's a lot of options now and affordable options. Before five, ten years ago, we had to spend a fortune to get a flame retardant pre couch. But now, for example, IKEA has phased out um, flame retardants. So that's the other kind of category that you're not going to see on a product label because it's in your built environment, but it is actually one of our bigger exposures in our house. Other questions? Um, so what ingredients should we look out for? And is it kind of like food products or the less ingredients the better kind of thing? Like in terms of these kind of, like what we should look out for and what we're putting in, in on our bodies. Yeah. I mean I would look for brands. We we make it you know, we kind of pumped up the font size on our ingredient labels so it's very easy to read. So you can and define the things and, and have like so you understand what is in um, in that ingredient uh, in the inside the formula. You know, the ingredient panel is very user friendly. So I guess when you're choosing a brand, like I would, you know, turn look look at the ingredient panel, and if you can understand what what's in it and it feels right to you, then I would say, you know, go with that product. I don't think it's. I mean, there are you can you know go with brands which is stuff you know just an almond oil. You know, if you want to be, you know. but I think. That there are brands out there that are using, you know, a combination um, in their formulas, but you know, they're still safe. But I just think, like, I feel comfortable when I understand what the ingredient panel is showing me, and that it's large enough that I can actually eat it. Um, what about for medicine? For medicine, I think um, you know we're the first ones that are really cleaning up the inactive ingredients, and so sometimes. Fewer ingredients is great, but there are some times that you have to use depending on the delivery form. So what I would say, like especially um, in the OTC aisle, is look for a certification. So for example, we have the non-GMO project certification, which indicates that 95% or more of the product is non-genetically modified. And in order to be non-genetically modified, it has to be a natural ingredient, it can't be a synthetic. So you know, there might be some kind of natural ingredients on there like dibuchinin that's a vegetable source and people are like, what is that? But looking at the certifications also helps indicate, okay, there aren't artificial things in here. So, yep. you know. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so it kind of depends on the product category. Some of the food rules of less ingredients is better doesn't necessarily translate to other product categories. So generally what a lot of the science is saying to your point um, just because an ingredient list is long doesn't mean something isn't happening for you. You just have to make sure you can do a deep dive to actually understand those ingredients. So there are tools out there that's a little bit different based on each product category. Um, but for personal care, for example, you know, deep skin deep database is not perfect, but it's a good starting point to be able to type in a product or an ingredient. If you're like, I don't know what that means. It kind of sounds like, you know, if it's not shea butter, if it's something you're not clear, you can put in and it helps give you a hazard score for those ingredients. So there are tools out there so you don't have to suddenly become a full-time detective in order to find safer products. Um, and then look for brands that you trust and recommend. So um, a lot of brands are kind of like cross-promoting different categories, which I think is nice. So you know, like, oh, Rachel's spending a lot of time looking at their prenatal are partnering with brands here. So like I think that's another kind of nice way to kind of expedite the searching process. 
Where are your products available to purchase? So, yeah, so spiritual.com. Um, we sell at the detox market uh, and uh, some of the food and food locations uh, and spas and salons. So, uh, are available in the retail area, or you can get a treatment service with our products as well. And we're also available on Jax.com, but we are in Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, basically major drugstores, grocery stores. Uh, and we just launched a new product, the first clean acetaminophen for adults. So you can tie on extra strength competitor uh, available in Walmart um, just two weeks ago. So cool. yeah. <laughs> and where is, is it, I know we can get virtual here, but is it in store? I'm not sure. Right now, this is our only retail location. Um, and actually, we just launched on, we did a soft launch on Amazon. Oh. So you can also find us there in ritual.com. Yeah, we're also on Amazon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are there any products that are boasting that they're natural or better for you that are common that you would steer away from? Mm, that's a big one. Good question. I mean, I think I wouldn't say that there are companies that are really making false claims because I think there are a lot of protections in our country that don't allow that. But I think that marketing sometimes can make it seem like something is really good for you. You know, we see that a lot in food, but you know, I think dye free, for example. Um, you know, there's a story that dye free was actually created not because they wanted to remove dyes for the health or clean benefits, but because if a child takes like a red medicine and spits it up, it would stain your clothes. So like that's the, in some ways like, the intention is not that great, but also when you look at that ingredient list of a dye free product, there are still mostly artificial and active ingredients that are in there. It's just missing that one artificial dye. So I think in some ways the marketing can kind of sway us into thinking, oh, this is better or worse. And so like some of the apps that you mentioned and you know just familiarizing yourself. I think food is the easiest to comprehend because you know the whole 30 movement taught us buy ingredients with less or like whole ingredients are better. And so then you can kind of apply that to beauty and then you know head into that OTC aisle. But you know there's a lot of marketing that's like New! <laughs> so I think it's always best to just turn it over, look for those inactive ingredients, or look and see what the other ingredients are, and then kind of determine from there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a lot of brands out there that say natural, and you know, they're in the aisles of so a lot of the stores that we shop in, um, in the beauty care category. And you know, you turn them over, and you'll see that it has like a synthetic fragrance in it, or phenoxyethanol, or like, how are they getting away with this? You know, how is it even like it's in their name, you know, even in the name of the product or the name of the brand? So it's just, again, you know, just familiar, familiarizing yourself on how to read an ingredient deck and um, like doing your research and just, you know, doing, like, not taking everything, anything for granted, just like see how people are presenting themselves and then just kind of look under the hood, I guess, you know, take some time to, to do that, educate yourself. There's also a bunch of great certifications out there that help take away some of the guesswork. So, um, and the certifications kind of hit different categories. So you mentioned non-GMO project, which really looks at sourcing. Um, the corporation looks at how the business practices it overall. Um, how ethical is that company? How much are they considering people on the planet um, in business decisions or um, USD or organic? Those types of things. So you can kind of look at based on whatever, whatever product category. I do think one industry that I think is pretty misleading still is fashion. So it's like a lots of people are like wanting to not be in the fast fashion food train, but then they, you know, aren't disclosing anything about their supply chain or where stuff is made in the factories and how people are treated. So I feel like that's the next category. Actually, the question about the nail polish. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, I know right now everyone's getting into like clean gels and polishes and stuff like that. But is there any sort of obviously there's a regulation, but is there any sort of certification to look for or things to not look for in a nail polish or gel when you're going to get your nails done or buying? 
Yeah, I mean, we only do uh, like a traditional nail polish. And mm -hmm. my uh, formula is it's just one step. So there's no need for a base coat or a top coat. So you try to minimize, you know, like not having, there's still chemicals in nail polish, but we, we, you know, we formulate with all those, you know, free of the hot button ingredients. We never got into gels. There was a lot of pressure to get into gels many years ago because the industry kind of went in that direction. There was definitely consumer demand. But, it, you know, gels are not as clean as more of a, you know, your traditional formula, which may not last as long. But, you know, it's okay to change your, you know, nail polish a little bit more often. Like, I don't know who said our nail polish has to last for, you know, 14 days. I don't think anything that we use on our face or our body or, you know, the natural food that we're, we're eating lasts for 14 days. So, you know, I guess it's more of a challenge to consumers. Like, I'm just curious why, I mean, not necessarily here, but just in general, like, why is that still a thing that we expect the, you know, the polish to last for so long? So, I mean, again, it's like looking at certifications, you know, we're vegan, um, you know, we list out what are what we're free of, you know, you can see that on our website. It's, it's, I think it's small on the bottle because it's just, we don't, have like a, a unit carton for, for nail polish. Um, but I don't know, I mean, with gels, when you're going in and you're getting the gels done and there are acrylics or a lot of people, the tips are really popular with the, um, you know, the younger generation. I don't know, I don't know, like that's kind of, there's still a lot of education I think that has to happen in that category. Um, you know, I mean, personally, I would just stick with, you know, more of a natural or, you know, free of, Polish and just change it out a little bit more often. And we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll wrap. Thank you, Mark. Um, synthetic versus natural is something that comes up a lot, and I'm curious, and maybe this is more like a personal preference or philosophy, but is it always true that natural is better than synthetic, or are there times where synthetic can actually scientifically be proven to be cleaner or better for the environment, et cetera? Yeah, yeah that, there's a raging a conversation about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely safe, safe synthetics, absolutely. And there are essential oils and natural ingredients that could, you know, cause allergic reaction. So I think, if, you know, you just have to know, like, try different things and know what's good for you. I mean, I... Thank you so much. So... Yes, I think that there's still, and there's, I think some of the brands that are coming out now, which are more, gearing more towards the synthetic, seem to be taking a stand, you know, making sure that they're, they're safer. Um, it, and then it's a personal choice, you know, I mean, I personally think we are an overly synthetic society in so many aspects of our life. So wherever I have an option to choose something that's more natural and make a deeper connection with nature, then I'm going to do it. And so for my body care products, that's definitely, you know, for beauty, that, that's definitely, and food and vitamins and, you know, now medicine. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I've used your brand uh, before. Um, you know, those are, that's a personal choice. That makes a personal choice. And for medicine, I think, you know, we make conventional over-the-counter medicines. We also make homeopathic over-the-counter medicines. So the homeopathic ingredients are all natural. But generally, I agree with that philosophy, too. Like, if there's a natural way to treat something or, you know, a different alternative, like, that's always my personal preference first is to go a little bit cleaner, but definitely keep the seed of benefit in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's a good question because it's, I feel like it's a debate that's been happening for a while, um, and certainly now on social media, and I think it, it yes, there's a personal preference to it, but also depends on what do you want the product to do, and what do you care about. So sometimes naturally sourced ingredients have human rights issues in the supply chain, or are um, some essential oils, for example, it takes a lot of lavender to get those drops of oil. And so like there are sustainability issues where maybe something that's synthetic could actually help address some of those issues. Um, but regardless of source, I think it's important for businesses to be asking the right questions, whether it's around the safety profile or um, sustainability questions, regardless of something is natural or synthetic um, and how kind of making decisions in totality. 
We want to make sure that you all have time to hit the road, and if you're heading to work, head to work. Um, we have a couple people here. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about Rituals products, we also have some goodie bags um, over there. I want to thank you both for your time coming out, and for everyone else um, who came out before the day started. Um, we're going to have a continued series that happens every single week. It's every week. Uh, check out Rituals social media accounts and or um, subscribe to our email list to get notifications. So thank you so much. We'll see you guys soon.